In the opening scenes, we see police officers with dogs searching for someone in the woods at night. Next, the events take us back to November 19, 2018. Paul and Wendy Michelson, along with their 10-year-old daughter Taylor, are going on a family camping trip. Paul is a veteran of the Gulf War. The curious daughter asks her father a million questions. Paul enjoys answering each of it. Everyone was in a great mood. The family is looking forward to a weekend outdoors. Finally, they arrived at a beautiful lake surrounded by autumn woods. The park owner, Tom Henry, explained that the place was not crowded at any time, nor was it safe. If the family was looking for a peaceful getaway, they clearly picked the wrong spot. But Paul and his wife were full of optimism, so they didn't pay much attention to these words. They parked their trailer in a rented lot. The couple are very happy to get out here and spend time together. It'll be good for them. While Paul was setting up, Wendy went to pay off the park owner. There was some other guy working at the park who looked withdrawn. Wendy entered Tom's little store, but no one responded. Meantime, Paul was getting ready for fishing when he suddenly noticed a pretty young woman. A nice conversation started between them. The girl introduced herself as Miranda and mentioned that she and her husband arrived yesterday. The Michaelsons were staying next door to them. Paul invited them over for dinner. Wendy returned with the groceries. They were looking forward to a wonderful vacation. It seemed like this tranquil place was perfect for a family picnic. Seeing their dog Lucky without a leash, Wendy told the daughter to watch over the pet. Taylor didn't respond, but the parents didn't pay much attention to it yet. However when Paul called the daughter to go fishing, she didn't show up again. Wendy went to check in the trailer, but Taylor wasn't there either. The worried parents started looking for their daughter. Paul admitted to his wife that he didn't see Taylor leaving the trailer. Maybe she had hidden somewhere. The spouses continued their search, but without success. The situation seems to be taking an alarming turn. Paul still believed that the daughter was somewhere nearby. She couldn't have gone too far. However, this hope didn't pan out. On the first day after the disappearance, the police initiated a search in the forest. Sheriff Baker asked his deputy Rakes if there was any updates on the fugitive who escaped from the jail. There were no updates so far. It was only known that the police had managed to injure him, but he had escaped. The sheriff spoke with the inconsolable parents. Wendy directly asked if the escaped convict could be connected to Taylor's disappearance. Sheriff Baker assured that everything was under control. Baker also asked the spouses to recall the details of the previous day. Paul said he hadn't noticed anything suspicious. He had been distracted by the tourist Miranda Hatton, and during that time Taylor likely disappeared. The sheriff said there were no witnesses. Neither the tourists nor the park owner Tom Henry, nor his assistant Justin Noose, had seen anything strange. However, Paul believed that the police should take a closer look at Justin Noose. This guy didn't inspire confidence. Sheriff Baker said there were no grounds to suspect him or the others. Furthermore, the Hattons had volunteered to assist in the search for Taylor. But for now, the sheriff didn't want the Hattons or Michaelsons personally involved in the search because the escaped criminal was armed. Before leaving, Baker left the couple his calling card and promised he would do his best. Night fell. Neither Wendy nor Paul could sleep. They felt powerless and had to just sit and wait. Wendy begged her husband to go searching for their daughter. She was sure that Taylor was in danger. Paul agreed with his wife, and taking two flashlights, he said they needed to act discreetly, away from the police. While the police conducted extensive searches, Taylor's parents called for their daughter, walking through the entire forest. Suddenly Wendy noticed a campfire. The spouses approached it and saw a sleeping injured man. They suspected that he was the escaped convict. Trying not to make any noise to avoid waking the criminal, the spouses approached him. Wendy took his gun, and at which point the man woke up. Police officers in the forest heard a gunshot. It was the second day since Taylor's disappearance. The spouses were contemplating their next steps. Wendy said they should tell the truth to the police, but Paul disagreed, as it had just been an accident. Paul was determined to do everything to protect his wife. They had to stick together, it was the only way to overcome it all. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. It was Sheriff Baker. Paul hid the gun and gave his wife a look that told her to keep quiet. When Paul opened the door, Sheriff Baker asked for permission to enter the trailer, saying he had news. Paul offered him coffee, noticing in the corner of his eye Wendy's hat with red stains. Paul supposedly accidentally spilled coffee, then wiped the puddle with the hat and threw it into the laundry to avoid raising suspicion. When Wendy finally emerged from the bathroom, Sheriff Baker asked the spouses to sit down and said they had apprehended the escaped convict on a bus. He was planning to leave for another state. The police had interrogated the convict and concluded that he had no connection to Taylor's disappearance. Also according to the sheriff, someone took the life of a tourist in the forest that night. That man had often visited the area on weekends and had participated in wilderness survival competitions with other tourists. Listening to this, Wendy struggled to contain her emotions. Later, Paul told his wife that what had been done couldn't be undone. It had been an accident. 
Now they had to focus on finding Taylor. Justin Noose, who was responsible for park cleanup, approached the spouses. He expressed sympathy for their grief and asked how old Taylor was. Wendy found it strange that Justin was speaking about Taylor in the past tense. Justin began to defend himself, assuring that he didn't mean anything by it. Afterward, he hurriedly left. Tom witnessed this conversation. Wendy looked at photos of the daughter, wanting to find her at all costs. As the sheriff had requested, the spouses went to the police station, where their fingerprints were taken. Sheriff Baker assured them it was a standard procedure. But in Wendy's opinion, it was a waste of time. The sheriff reminded that they were doing everything they could. Later, the sheriff and Taylor's parents addressed the press. Baker said that Taylor's disappearance and the tourist's demise in the forest were likely unrelated. The parents also made a statement, urging anyone with information to contact them. Justin watched this interview on the news. Flyers about Taylor's disappearance were posted everywhere. After some hesitation, Paul finally left a message for his brother Jeffrey, telling him about Taylor and asking for a call. The brothers hadn't been in touch much lately. The spouses returned to the spot where Taylor had disappeared. Miranda and her husband Eric brought them dinner, wanting to help in any way they could. They could only imagine what it must be like for the inconsolable parents. Not wanting to continue the conversation, Wendy walked back into the trailer. When the Hattons left, Wendy expressed to her husband everything she was thinking. She believed that Paul was openly flirting with Miranda. Paul claimed he was just trying to be polite, but the wife didn't believe him, accusing of being responsible for Taylor's disappearance. If he hadn't been distracted by Miranda, their daughter would be with them now. Paul reassured his wife, promising that they would overcome this together and bring their daughter back. The spouses had no idea that Miranda was watching them from her trailer at that moment. At night Sheriff John Baker, after having a drink, practiced shooting. Later, the wife asked if there were any developments in the Taylor Michelson case. But John as usual remained silent. His job had plunged him into deep depression. At night, Paul woke up to the sound of the daughter's voice. It turned out that Wendy was watching old videos from the family archive. She had been sleepless for two days. Wendy suspected Eric, who claimed that at the time of Taylor's disappearance, he was supposedly watching TV, even though there was no TV network here. Wendy was planning to call the sheriff and tell him about this, but the husband stopped her. What his wife was saying made no sense at all. Nevertheless, Wendy continued to insist that they should check this theory. In the end Paul gave in, and together they infiltrated the Hatton's trailer, searching everything inside. In the bathroom cabinet, Wendy found a lot of prenatal vitamins, indicating that the couple was trying to have a baby. Perhaps their unsuccessful attempts had driven them to a desperate act. Wendy believed that Miranda intentionally distracted Paul while Eric was acting. Paul didn't believe this theory but agreed to check the trunk. At that moment, the Hattons returned. The McHalesons acted as if they just wanted to know if there were any news. Wendy suggested meeting at the dock at 7 a.m. tomorrow to search for Taylor together. The third day since Taylor's disappearance. The McHalesons were joined on the pier by the Huttons. Wendy couldn't stand these people, but she wanted to get closer to them to learn as much as possible. She was convinced that they were somehow involved in Taylor's disappearance. Everyone got into a boat and set off, combing the lake. Suddenly Wendy saw something floating in the water at the other end of the lake. Eric also looked through the binoculars and said it was just a garbage bag, so there was no need to approach it closely. However, the McHalesons insisted on checking it. Eric turned out to be right. Wendy pulled the bag out of the water and asked Eric why he didn't want to look inside. Eric didn't understand what she was talking about and tried to start the boat's engine. It turned out that they had run out of fuel. At that moment, Wendy and Paul openly accused the Hattons. It seemed ironic that the couple was trying to have a baby while the McHalesons' daughter was missing. Eric figured out that Wendy and Paul had been going through their things. The McHalesons didn't even try to deny it and advised the Hattons to come clean before it was too late. Eric no longer wanted to hear this nonsense, and taking an oar, was about to row away. At that moment, Wendy took out the gun from her backpack. The situation was beginning to take a serious turn. Miranda, barely holding back her emotions, tried to calm Wendy down, but she was unstoppable. Wendy was sure that Miranda had her eye on Paul because unlike her husband, he was able to be a father. At that moment, Eric tried to neutralize Wendy. The boat capsized, and a struggle broke out between the men in the water. Eventually after injuring Eric, Paul swam to the surface and pulled his wife out. Miranda was nowhere to be found, but the spouses had more pressing concerns. Docking at the shore, they fled the scene. Justin Noose drove by their trailer just at that moment. Rakes informed John that the FBI had contacted them and offered assistance in the search. But Baker didn't want to involve the FBI, confident that he could handle it himself. Later, John visited the McHalesons again, asking them to remember any other details. Any little details could be significant. However, the spouses had nothing more to add. They just wanted the police to do their job conscientiously and bring Taylor home. Leaving the trailer, 
John pondered. Suddenly something made him knock on the Hatton's trailer, but no one answered. Then the sheriff looked into the trunk and found ropes. Of course John entered the trailer to take a look around. At some point, his attention was drawn to the red beads. In the cabinet, he found prenatal vitamins and pregnancy tests. Rakes interrupted him, informing of the gruesome discovery in the lake. A body had been found. Upon seeing this, the spouses rushed there, but it was not Taylor, it was Eric. The sheriff showed the red beads to the spouses and asked if they were familiar with it. Wendy said that they were Taylor's favorite beads. John didn't hide the fact that the beads were found in the Hatton's trailer. Now the police had every reason to believe that this was a planned crime. Miranda might shed light on what happened. John shared his own life tragedy. Several years ago he lost his son, who struggled with addiction. Now the sheriff wanted to do everything to prevent others from experiencing the same pain. The spouses contemplated their next steps. They didn't know for sure if Miranda was still alive. Now the police would spend time searching for her. Wendy wanted to tell the police everything, but Paul believed that Eric's demise was also an accident. They did it for Taylor's sake. However, at least now the McHalesons had the certainty that the Hattons were involved in Taylor's disappearance. This explained why her beads were in their trailer. But neither Eric nor Miranda could tell them where their daughter was. Justin watched the progress of the investigation attentively from the sidelines. He directly asked Tom if he was behind all of this. Tom accused the guy of ingratitude. He had raised Justin since he was 14, giving him a job and a roof over his head. That's why Justin's suspicions seemed offensive to him. But Justin knew Tom too well and had no doubt that he was somehow involved in Taylor's disappearance. For this, Justin received a slap. Handing the guy a small package, Tom told him to keep quiet and left. Justin watched as unsuspecting Paul walked his dog. The search in the forest continued. The spouses couldn't sleep at night. Paul was confident that they would find Taylor, but there was another problem. Sooner or later, the police would find out what they did to the tourist, Eric and Miranda. So their arrest was only a matter of time. Wendy couldn't bear to accept this thought. To distract herself, she went outside to get some fresh air. At some point, a spontaneous idea came to her to visit Tom's store. The owner himself was not here. Suddenly Wendy heard strange sounds from the utility room. Although there was a sign on the door saying no entry, Wendy was going to go in anyway. At that moment Tom came out, rudely saying that the store was closed. Wendy pretended she wanted to buy a chocolate bar and rent a couple of movie discs. Before Wendy left, Tom called out to her and said he sympathized with them because of their daughter. Lurking, Wendy watched Tom go into the utility room, which he always locked. Wendy already suspected everyone. She had no idea that Justin also had something to hide. When Wendy returned to the trailer, she gave her husband a scandal. She was tired of inaction, but Paul couldn't do anything. Feeling powerless, Paul locked himself in the bathroom while Wendy drank wine. After some time, there was a knock on the door. It was Justin. He apologized in advance for not being much of a talker. Justin just wanted to express his sympathy and wish them a good night. Wendy decided to follow Justin, who as often happens, was smoking something illegal. At some point, he noticed a silhouette outside the window. Wendy hid, then returned to her trailer. Paul managed to get some sleep. When he came out of the bathroom and made sure his wife was asleep, he took out a cigar from the medicine cabinet and went outside to smoke. Paul lay right on the pier, and suddenly his attention was drawn to bubbling under the bridge. Turning on his flashlight, Paul saw Taylor in the water. In a panic, Paul begged the daughter to wake up as suddenly a scream rang out. It was just a nightmare. Paul woke up from the scream. Leaving the trailer, he saw that his wife was the one screaming. During the night, someone had taken the life of their dog. Paul was tired of waiting for results from the police and told the sheriff that they weren't working diligently enough. However, John and his team were working round the clock, doing everything within their power. When the sheriff advised Paul and his wife to check into a hotel, Paul stated that they wouldn't leave until their daughter returned to them. The couple was unaware that forensic scientists found a hair on Eric Hatton's ring. However, the DNA analysis wasn't ready yet. Wendy wouldn't talk to her husband, locking herself in a separate room. Paul kept knocking on the door, but Wendy didn't respond. She couldn't bear it any longer and wanted to end her suffering. Meanwhile, the sheriff was talking to Justin, who was clearly nervous. He claimed he hadn't harmed Lucky and didn't know anything. But John knew all about Justin, including the fact that his parents had abandoned him. Also John guessed that Justin had a substance problem. He wouldn't confuse it with anything else because his son suffered from addiction. Justin continued to deny any involvement, saying with tears in his eyes that he wasn't aware. However, the sheriff suspected that the young man was covering up for someone. Right after Justin left, Baker received a call that made him anxious. He immediately arrived at the hospital and learned that Wendy had taken too much sedative. According to the nurse, the woman's life is not in danger right now. 
At the sheriff's insistence, the spouses spoke with a psychiatrist who explained that people facing loss go through stages of denial, anger and depression. This continues until acceptance finally comes. Many couples drift apart during this time, so it's essential for Wendy and Paul to remember they must stay together, no matter what. At the same time, they must not lose hope. During the night, John was looking at photos of his son, while Justin disposed of the substances in the trash. Wendy couldn't sleep again at night. Taking the movie discs, she went outside when suddenly a police officer shone a flashlight on her. Wendy said she just wanted to return the discs. In reality this was just an excuse to come to Tom's store. Wendy wouldn't leave until she found out what was in the utility room. The door was locked of course. But Wendy knew where the key was, having previously followed Tom. Unlocking the door, Wendy entered. She was sure that the answers to her questions were here. Apparently, it wasn't just a utility room. Judging by the furnished sleeping area, Tom lived here. Behind a closet, Wendy found another entrance. Pushing the closet aside, Wendy found herself in a hidden corridor. Everything indicated that someone else was living here. In one of the rooms, there were many videotapes and a television. Turning on one of the tapes, Wendy saw Tom and some girl. At that moment, Tom sneaked up behind Wendy and knocked her out. In the middle of the night, Paul woke up and couldn't find his wife nearby. She was nowhere in the trailer. While Tom hastily covered the tracks, Paul decided to make some coffee, confident that his wife had gone outside for some fresh air. They had run out of sugar. Tom gathered all the tapes into a trash bag and was about to dispose of them when suddenly Paul came up to him, saying he wanted to buy sugar. Tom looking nervous, refused to take money for the sugar. When asked if he had seen Wendy, Tom said no. Meanwhile, Wendy managed to free herself from the duct tape. When Tom entered, she attacked him. A struggle ensued between them. In the end Wendy managed to knock Tom out and escape. She immediately reported what had happened to the police. It was the fifth day of the disappearance. Tom passed away from his injuries. In his utility room, a collection of explicit videos was found. Wendy faced no charges, as she had acted in self-defense. The sheriff believed that Tom was involved not only in Taylor's disappearance but also in what happened to the Hattons. Later, John Baker told the spouses about his intention to call off the search on the lake. The sheriff didn't think Taylor was there. The FBI got involved in the case. Now Paul and Wendy can only watch and wait. From Rakes, John learned that nothing had been found in Justin's trailer. Paul gathered all of the daughter's belongings into a box, telling his wife that they had to accept the fact that Taylor wasn't coming back. It was time to stop tormenting themselves. Wendy was so shocked that she didn't know how to react. The husband simply said that he couldn't bear to look at their daughter's things anymore. It caused him immense pain, and he couldn't go on. Wendy didn't stop her husband as he threw the box into the trash. Perhaps it was truly time for them to accept it. John drinks heavily and has lost understanding with his wife. At night unable to resist, Justin climbed into the trash to find the substances. However besides it, he found Taylor's belongings. Justin brought it into his trailer, and after some hesitation, called the sheriff but ended up on voicemail. It was the sixth day since the disappearance. In the morning, John found a note from his wife, stating that she couldn't take it anymore and had decided to leave forever. Thus, John was left alone with his depression. Looking at the family photo of the McHalesons, John noticed something strange and immediately called Rakes. In the photo, Wendy was captured when she was nine months pregnant with the twin towers in the background, even though it hasn't existed for 17 years. Meanwhile, their daughter Taylor was only 10 years old. The police contacted Jonathan, Paul's brother, who explained that Taylor had died six years ago in a river accident. Her parents initially went to a therapist but later stopped. Sometimes they experienced collective hallucinations, believing that Taylor was still alive. They even once took her to school. Jonathan didn't know how to help his brother. It turned out that the DNA found on Eric's ring belonged to Paul. The police immediately went to the lake, but the McHalesons' trailer was no longer here. There are five stages of denial for those who have lost a loved one. However, the McHalesons never managed to come to terms with the loss. Earlier, Paul unconsciously left Taylor's beads in the Hatton's trailer to make their self-deception seem more plausible. It's a very fine line between denial and hope. Justin realized it too, when he saw the embroidered date on Taylor's towel. In the final scene, we see Paul and Wendy driving away in their trailer, watching a video from their family archive. On that fateful day, they were also preparing for a picnic. The pain of loss proved too strong, so it's easier for the couple to pretend their daughter is still with them. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel not to miss more exciting new products. Also the authors will be pleased if you leave your opinion in the comments.